Hello everyone again and, and thank you for joining us for our newest informational webinar. This one is about experimenting at the root, the Yeti DNS project. Uh, as I said before, my name is Dagmar, I'll be your facilitator today and um, with me is Karsten Strotman from Menemize Professional Services team. He will be giving you all the insights on the Yeti project. Uh, we'll be taking questions during the webinar, so if you use the questions functionality of the GoToWebinar, I'll collect them and submit them to Karsten afterwards. Uh, please note that all attendees are on mute. We are also recording the session and you'll find the webinar along with the slides at our website within a few days and uh, it will also be emailed your way. Uh, without any further ado, I'll hand this over to Kast. Thank you, Lua. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Carsten from the Menemized Professional Services team and today we have an, uh, um, a premiere. Uh, we have actually a new technology on the webinars. We will have uh, an interview this time. And the topic is uh, Yeti DNS. And uh, I was uh, able to catch the Yeti DNS coordinator, Shane Kerr, uh, on an interview um, to talk about this, this exciting project. Um, I won't talk about what you did in it uh, now because uh, Shane can explain that much better than I do and he does that in the interview and we have pre-recorded the interview prior to this webinar. Uh, please stay tuned after the webinar. We have uh, two small tutorials where we show how to uh, configure a bind line resolver or an unbound resolver to use the Yeti DNS system. So if you want to participate in that uh, great project, uh, we show you how to do that. But now, we start with the uh, uh, with the interview. Welcome, Shane. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thanks first. for thanks for being here on our first uh, Manamized webinar interview. Uh, today we talk about uh, Yet DNS, but before we jump into Um, currently, it seems to we have audio problems here. Wait a second. I'm, I'm switching over. That actually looks good. Yeti DNS, can you tell us a little bit where you are coming from? Why are you work in DNS space? Yeah, so I um, I worked on the internet for a while. I was a staff member at ARIN, which is the American Registry, Ripe NCC, which is European Registry for numbers. And um, after that, um, I got connected to ISC, who's the company that makes and maintains Bind, that I think still the most popular DNS software, if you're talking about servers. Um, and working for, for ISC, I wasn't I wasn't initially focused on Bind or DNS software, um, but I did eventually get asked to lead the Bind 10 project, um, which was a an attempt to uh, kind of fix most of the problems that I perceived with Bind 9, um, make a, a radical change in the way software works and the way that the DNS uh, DNS servers is delivered. Um, that project ultimately failed. Um, at that point, I had to admit that I was a DNS person. Um, so since that time, I've been working at DNS companies, uh, doing DNS stuff. Um, I worked for Dyn, which is a big DNS service delivery company. And um, previous to that, I'd worked at Affilius, which is a company, one of the registries that runs uh, org info and uh, a bunch of other CCTLDs and things like that. And I current company called um, BII, the Beijing Internet Institute, which is a Chinese company based out of Beijing. Um, and about a year and a half ago, about a few a few months before I started there, um, they decided they wanted to uh, look at the DNS community and see what they could do. Uh, BII, we've been involved with. IPv6 for a long time, more than a decade now, um, and we've been involved with SDN also for many years. Um, 
I think even before it became a super buzzword, uh, we were involved with SDN. Um, and so now we're also looking at um, DNS software, and that's kind of where the Yeti project comes in. So what exactly is Yeti DNS? So um, in order to understand the Yeti DNS, you have to know a little bit about how the root name server system works. So if you, I guess most of the people watching this probably know basically how DNS works. Um, it starts at the root, which are the, the very first servers that a DNS resolver goes to when it's trying to figure out how to convert a name into something else, usually an IP address. Um, right now, those the root is a letter. The, the servers are identified by a letter. Um, so A through M, and they're called A root server, B root server, and things like that. These uh, root servers have been operated um, by 12 organizations since 1997, 1998, something like that. Um, and these, these 12 organizations have not been changed so much since then. Um, there has been a few cases where the management of a root server is, has moved around because a company was bought and things like that. But basically it's the same organizations. Uh, and the and same people probably. Many of the same people, indeed. And um, so when we say that there's 13 letters, that doesn't mean there's 13 big, huge boxes somewhere. Uh, because it's the internet, these are mostly delivered by something called NACAST, which means that for these 13 servers, there's literally hundreds of machines scattered all around the globe. Um, and these, these companies are, some of them are for-profit companies, some of them are non-profit organizations, some of them are uh, departments and universities, there's several run by the U.S. government, U.S. military, and NASA, things like that. Um, but And they all try to do a very good job, of course. No one gets paid for running the services or anything like that. Um, but one of the things that, that has been a problem is that um, there's, there's no real way to investigate how the system works. Like, we have the system that we have now, and it has basically been unchanged for the past 16, 17 years. Now, there's several reasons for that. That's also about the same time that ICANN became an organization running the Internet, which is almost exactly the same time that John Postel died. Now, John Postel was uh, one of the early founders of the Internet, um, and he, one of his big contributions was the management of these sort of Internet resources. So um, he worked before there were regional internet registries like Aaron and Ripe NCC that I talked about. Um, he was the guy who had a notebook, like a piece of paper that he carried around, and, and he wrote down who was responsible for which IP addresses, who was responsible for managing which um, TLDs, uh, well, originally the, the GTLDs, then country codes and things like that. And it was all basically done because he cared very much about the internet and did a good job at it. Um, and over the history of the DNS during the time that he was involved, uh, the, the, the number and, and way that the root servers were organized changed. So originally I believe there was four or five, uh, more root servers got added. They reached a point where uh, there, were no, there was no ability to add more because of the packet size limitations. At that time you could only have 512 bytes in a packet. Um, and and it, it expanded from there. Um, someone came up with notice that if we if we named all the servers from the same uh, subdomain uh, from the same domain that we could add more and that's when the number of servers expanded to 13 and that's that's where we're at today um, and then and then Don Pastel died uh, a, a bit younger than any of us would have hoped but at that point evolution stopped and this was quite a while ago and so the internet of course has evolved since then there have been some changes in the root system um, we've added IPv6 the root zone was signed uh, a little over five years ago we now have DNSSEC at the root um, but but fundamentally the the people who are running it and the way it's run haven't changed and it's very difficult to know what would be a 
what changes would be necessary or would improve the system of delivering the root zone. So this is kind of the scenario of the world uh, just over a year ago when a few of my colleagues, my colleagues now, were at the wide camp in, uh, I, believe it, I believe it was in, I don't know where it was, but somewhere in Japan. Wide is an organization in Japan which is, has a long history of researching network is issues. They are uh, government and education and corporations all working together to improve the Japanese internet. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues, Paul Vixie, had been invited. He was talking with uh, Akira Kato, who is actually a Japanese professor working with WIDE, and one of my own colleagues, uh, Davey Song, who works for BII. And they were talking about this problem of, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could research and investigate the root server system, look at alternate models, look at new technologies and things like that. So basically, I think over the course of a few beers, they decided, hey, let's try to Let's try to design a system that, that looks like the root server system that we could use for researching uh, technologies on it. And we'll, I guess we'll talk more about that later. And so they did. They designed a, a model of, of a production scale model of testing the root server system. And that is the Yeti project. Um, so the whole idea is you want something that looks very much like the root server system today, uh, but can be tested with new and and interesting things, which, to be honest, are quite likely to break things. Um, that's why you can't do these kind of tests on the real world system. Um, and I guess we can talk more about how exactly how the technology works too. But that's the basic idea. We want to do research into the root server system in a way that's not going to break the internet. So you uh, mentioned already BII and White and Paul Bixi, um meeting there and having these ideas of, of yeah. running the, this um, experiment of uh, having a, a test bed for the root name server system. Um, are these the, the organizations that are, or the individuals running the, the project or are there other people also involved? So um, the project like all great internet projects, doesn't have any uh, foundation or official organization. There's no signed documents between parties or anything like that. It's a very loosely organized group of interested people. Um, so the, the three the three groups that we talked about there are BII, my own company, Beijing Internet Institute, WIDE, the WIDE project, uh, which we discussed, and then Paul Vixi, who's, um, what, Paul has many, many hats. Um, he does a lot of different things uh, in various places on the internet. In this case, he's just doing it as an interested individual and researcher. Um, he does have a he does have a domain name registered that he does his work on this on TISF, but basically TISF is just Paul in his capacity as part of the Yeti project. So these three groups act as the coordinators of the project. So. Um, we're the ones who set up the server which collects um, query data. We run the web server where people can go to find out information about it. We run the mailing list and things like that. And um, uh, yeah, we, we, we have calls every week or, week or two to make sure that everything's going well, organize face-to-face -face meetings and things like that. Um, but those are those are the people involved with, as we said, coordinating it. These aren't the people that run the project or that are super responsible for it. Um, there's two other kinds of roles. Well, there's, there's several other roles in the project. Um, now, right now, we have well, we have what's called distribution masters. So, in the in the Yeti model, um, we actually since we're since we're trying to mim mimic the root zone, we have people who produce the root zone that the rest of the system will serve. In a similar way to how IANA and VeriSign produce the IANA root zone, or ICANN and VeriSign produce the IANA root zone, um, we have the Yeti distribution masters who produce the Yeti root zone. Um, right now, 
that is also the coordinators. So it's uh, BII, WIDE, and POVXC. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but that's the way it is today. Um, we also have a bunch of people who are running the Ready Yeti root servers. Uh, right now we've got, I believe, 16 uh, different organizations running name servers right now something like that. It's on our web page, I'd have to check to be sure, but something like 16 different organizations. Um, and people, individuals can also join the project. Um, and uh, we've also got um, people running resolvers, which use the Yeti service, that's a very important part of our project, as well as people who are on the mailing list and discussing the research and things like that. Um, now there's no, and as I said, there's no, there's no way you sign up. You don't have to commit anything like that. So we don't have, we don't have a good, we don't have an exact number for the number of people that are using the EID project for research and things like that. Um, but those are the rough numbers of the people involved. Um, you, you talked about that the the EID root zone is being produced. Is it um, uh, a one-to-one -one copy of the original root zone, or are there any changes there? Or is it a completely different one? So, one thing we haven't really talked about too much is that root zone management is a very, very political issue. And oftentimes in American conversation, we talk about things being political. We mean that in a informal sense. So you might have office politics or politics on your sport team and things like that. Uh, in this case, we do mean that in formal sense in that there are a lot of organizations that have a lot of ideas about how the root zone should run as well. But we are also talking about actual politics, by which I mean uh, governments, appointed officials, elected officials, and things like that. Um, in the in the case of, of ICANN, for example, um, uh, U.S. politicians will occasionally make statements about how the internet should work and things like that. So, the root zone, the root server system, is one of those things that it's highly visible, and it's something that m most people can understand, even with just a passing knowledge of the internet. Well, they wouldn't. I wouldn't say they have deep understanding, but they kind of get it. Um, so there's a lot of people who are, are interested in the root zone and concerned about it running properly, which I think is fair. Um, so the work that we're doing comes very close to this and therefore is very politically sensitive. It's, we, we try to be very careful about um, what we say and what we do. This is especially true because the organizations involved, um, one of the coordinators, one of the f people that helped found the project is Chinese. And as probably everyone knows, uh, the, the relationship between the internet and China is, is complicated um, and it makes a lot of people nervous when you start hearing about Chinese researchers looking at the root DNS servers. Um, so and I, I didn't talk too much about the organizations that are involved with the project, but we've also got uh, people from India and Russia, as well as the U.S. and lots of European members, um, most of which are from countries which don't have any root servers now. So um, the reason I bring all this up is that we have to be very careful about what we do to the root zone. Our project is concerned with the root server system. We're not concerned about the root zone itself. Um, now, the, the distinction there is the root server system is kind of a delivery mechanism, right? So these are the, the pipes that get the water into your house, right? We're not concerned about how that water is produced or what goes in the water. We don't care about that because the internet is a series of tubes. Um, so, 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 that gives us a lot of, that, that restricts the, the things that we can do because we don't want to concern ourselves with the contents of the root zone, but it also gives us a lot more freedom because we don't want to make people scared and concerned and we want people to take our research seriously. So, getting back to your question, what do we do to the root zone? Uh, we have on our, on our mission statement for the project, on our goals, we say we have 
complete loyalty to IANA in the contents of the root zone, we do not modify it. That's, that's our pledge to the world. And we've had some people proposing that we um, do some experiments which involve slight modifications, which probably fit within the spirit of that, but are not completely following the, the letter of the law, say. And right now it looks like we're not going to do any of those experiments because we want to be very, very careful. Um, so what we do now, just to give the more technical details, we actually download the comp copy of the root zone uh, periodically from the root servers. Uh, right now I believe we're using the F root server. Um, it doesn't really matter where we get it from. The zone is signed with DNSSEC. You can verify it. We could download it from IANA. Um, and then I think four or five of the root servers allow you to zone transfer from them, which is why we use the F root server. It's uh, the, the reason we chose F was we just happened to notice that it was the most up-to-date. I've since done some research, and I'm not at all confident that that is correct. Um, but in any case, we, we download a latest copy of the, the root zone that IANA is publishing, um, that the IANA root server system is publishing. And then we uh, take out all the signatures from DNSSEC. Um, and the reason we do that is because we, have, we, can't, we need to modify the zone slightly and we have to sign it ourselves. Um, we don't have the ICANN keys, uh, which is good. Um, if, if we were able to get them, then, <laughs> then, then the world would be a horrible place. Yeah, then, be then, a problem. Yeah, then anyone could get it, right? Um, but we take out, so we have to use our own keys for that. Uh, and uh, we, we, we change the, the set of name servers that serves dot. Mm -hmm. um, because so, it's a technical uh, necessity. To do exactly, that. exactly. Um, and that's basically it. So we have a number of, if you if you look at the root zone, it'll say dot ns a dot root servers dot net b c d and so on. Uh, we we take that out and add our own. Um, and that's it. And then we sign the zone and publish it. So all the, the only change that we do is we change the name servers that are serving the zone because we have to do that in order for it to use our servers and not the IANA servers. Is the the, the ETDNS project already uh, operational in the sense that already experiments are, are running? Yeah, as as with all great projects, we have very aggressive timelines and great hopes for our success. Um, we we took much longer to get the project uh, organized than we had hoped originally. Uh, we we have a, had a few problems that we didn't foresee having in terms of synchronizing data between the distribution masters, which I discussed, and things like that. Those were all resolved a few months ago. Um, we've actually just concluded our first experiment, and we're working on a write-up of that now. And uh, we've actually started our second experiment. So our first experiment was what we call the multi-ZSK model. So I don't know, do you want to talk about the details for that? or uh, Maybe a little bit that might be interesting for our listeners. OK, OK. So uh, if, if you know about DNSSEC right now, usually the key for a zone is split into two parts, the, key, the KSK and the ZSK. Um, and the, in the case of, of the root zone, the KSK is held by uh, ICANN and is done with some magical hardware security module with split up with security officers that are flown in from all around the world. And there's a very elaborate process. Yeah, which can be also seen during the key signing ceremonies, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, we don't have that. Um, people people have asked us about use of harder security modules and things like that, um, but that's not really what we're interested in researching. So basically, we say no. Um, now, the other part of it is the ZSK, the zone signing key, which in the uh, ICANN VeriSign model is held by VeriSign, and VeriSign generates a new one, I believe, every every quarter. At four times a year, 
and then that gets signed by the KSK, and that's what's used to actually sign the, the root zone. Um, so in our model, we've got three different distribution masters who all download the IANA root zone, do this modification that I talked about, about replacing the IANA root servers with our own root servers, and then publish it to our actual root servers, the, I, the Yeti root servers. Um, we have three organizations doing that, and until a few months ago, we all shared all of the secret key material. What we've done since then is the multi-ZSK experiment. So now each, each of the distribution masters generates its own ZSK separately, just like Veristein does, and only gets the, the public part of that signed by the KSK. Um, so we have a bit of splitting of uh, responsibilities um, and we needed to test that in production. So what, what this actually means though is that the, the resolvers, the people that are actually checking the signatures need to know about all of the different ZSKs. So we've actually got four four keys in our zone right now, one for the KSK and then each of the three ZSKs. And we needed to test that for a number of different cases. We wanted to test it if we're rolling the key because when you go from an old key to a new key, which you do periodically, um, they both need to be in the zone for a period of time. So what we actually tested was having uh, seven keys at once, the KSK, as well as each of the ZSKs rolling, um, to verify that that would work. Um, there's a few interesting things that happen with that. One is because of all this extra data, which is cryptographic and everything, the, the things get bigger. Yeah, large packages. Large packets, that's right, that's right. And um, we start encountering interesting things like a fragmentation. Uh, the packets become too big to fit into our packet size now. We're using only IPv6, um, and IPv6 has a minimum packet size that every network is supposed to guarantee to be supported of 1,280 bytes, or octets if you're in the IETF, but I call them bytes because I'm old school. Um, and so what a lot of DNS software will do is just split the packets at that limit. And once we passed that, that size, we started getting two packets. Um, we discovered a bug in someone's root server, a Yeti root server, uh, because they were using some sort of um, uh, Linux kernel filtering, which had a bug that didn't support it. And these are the kind of things you expect to find, and that's what we found. Um, and we ran through all the tests. Um, we ran it for a while. We've captured all the packets to see what the behavior on the traffic was. Um, we discovered some problems with uh, secondary. These are all being written up. It was actually really cool to see this actual kind of real, real work being done. Um, that, that means uh, having three uh, zone signing keys that um, uh, not all zone signing keys were signing the whole zone. There were, weren't three signatures on all data. Instead, Correct. it was one signature, but it could be one out, out of three different signatures. Correct. Correct. DNSSEC has, I believe it's an explicit in the standard OR. So if any of the signatures verify, then you consider the data to be correct. That's important for when you're rolling the keys, of course. Um, so we took advantage of that. And yeah, so when you do a normal query, like if you're looking up, uh, you know, belastingdeans.nl, um, that's the Dutch tax authorities, you'll, you'll do the lookup and um, um, you'll, oh, I forgot where I was going with that. Anyway, sorry, my brain just died. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You, do, you do a normal lookup for blastingdeans.nl, and you'll get only the answer and the signature for that one signature. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, 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 it doesn't expand the size of most queries. It's only this kind of priming query, we call it, uh, that you need to to do have additional data. Yeah, have the all all the public zone signing keys, which are all the DNS key resource records, all the yes. DNS key resource records out of the root zone, which is then quite big, or can be quite big in case of a exactly. rollover. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it can be quite big, and we actually exceeded we exceeded 1,500 bytes, which is another magic limit in the networking world because that's normally the packet size for Ethernet. Yes. Okay. So. But uh, this only happen when all the keys are rolled at the same time. So it could be yeah. with careful orchestration avoided. Possibly. We, but what we wanted to do, because we're experimenting here, is we wanted to see the worst case behavior. 
uh, which turned out to not be so bad. But I'll be honest, I haven't finished looking at the data traces. So what I'm hoping is that we'll get some interesting graphs. We'll see. Um, We'll see an inc we'll see how much of an increase there is with TCP traffic, for example. We'll see if there's additional retries because of packet loss and things like that. It'll be interesting to dig into that data. I just haven't had a chance to do that yet. The results of the experiments will they be uh, available publicly on the ETDM's website or elsewhere? Yeah, we we have a commitment to do as everything in this public as possible. So we've actually designed a experiment protocol. Um, for how we do our testing. Uh, in this case, we don't mean protocol like packets on the wire. We mean protocol and like a series of steps for doing things. And uh, what I wanted to do was make sure that Yeti uh, was as as useful scientifically as possible. So one of the things that's happened in this, the larger scientific world lately is people have started to look at um, how research research is done. And for example, there was a big problem in the medical community a few years ago in that if you were doing a research on a type of drug, for example, to see if it was effective, um, if you were doing a single study and you say had 20 patients and 10 of them it worked for and 10 of them it didn't, if you excluded the 10 that it didn't, that would be considered research fraud, and rightly so. However, if you had 10 different papers and only half of the papers showed successful results and you excluded those, no one noticed. Uh, it, was, it was called the file drawer effect, which meant that only papers that showed the results that were interesting to you would be published. Um, and so one of the things that's been done to combat this is that if you're going to look for something now, you say it in advance uh, so you can't just not publish uninteresting things. Another related thing is that if you have a whole bunch of data, uh, you're, you're going to find something interesting. It's the law, the law of large numbers. There's always some pattern somewhere in there. So what, what I wanted to do is make sure that no one could accuse us of sort of manipulating the story um, by changing what we're looking for after we started. So in our experimental protocol, we state in advance what we're going to do and we say what we're looking for, and then at the end we publish those results. So in this case, um, it was fairly simple. We did some lab tests first to make sure we weren't going to break our production network. Even though it's an experimental network, we don't want to do things which are just going to break stuff. Um, and then we published what we're going to look for in the experiment. And to be honest, really all that we're looking for is that we don't break the network, <laughs> that the thing continues to function. And then we're going to look for these other interesting things in terms of um, retries and fail it back to TCP and things like that. Um, so that's our that's our plan. And like I said, I've written the first draft of the report. We're, my colleagues are reviewing that now. I haven't done the going through all the all the data yet. Um, it's actually already on GitHub in my own per private account. Uh, once we're happy with it, we'll we'll do a pull request and pull it into our um, public GitHub. Uh, the project GitHub say. Um, we do most of our technical documentation of things on GitHub. It's just a convenient way to share uh, proposed changes and things like that. Um, we may turn this and other uh, results into more academic papers. So that will involve uh, I'm, I'm hoping my colleagues will do that. They have more experience with academic journals than I do. So it, we need to, the, 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 re, the results that I've written, for example, don't have a lot of um, a lot of background and explanation of how DNSSEC works and how the root servers works. Because I assume that people on the Yeti project who are interested about it and are reading their paper are going to already know about most of this stuff. Um, so an academic paper needs a little bit more background, so probably twice as long, and maybe have some, I don't know, uh, LaTeX graphs and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, it should all be public, that's the idea. Cool. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the Yidi project is IPv6 only. How realistic is that uh, for testing uh, something like the root service system? Because the internet will be dual stack for a long time. 
uh, might that not be that you are maybe the project is missing some some side effects that only occur in a dual stack network, but not in a pure IPv6? So I think there's there's a few a few aspects of that. Um, that is a valid criticism, and one one possible answer to that is that, well, you know, we've got 11 or 12 percent of the internet using IPv6 today. It's doubling every year, I guess, something like that. So in a few years, IPv4 will be a, a fond memory of network engineers sitting around talking about the good old days when we talked about our PDP 11s and things like that. Um, but I think realistically that's probably not the case. We're going to have we're going to need to support IPv4 forever and ever. However, uh, another possible answer to that is that um, if we were going to make modifications to the existing IANA root system, it might be difficult to draw a lot of conclusions from some of the results that we're going to publish. Um, however, uh, one 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 possible answer to that is that there are many ways that you could alter the, the root server system. So one proposal would be to have uh, a parallel IPv6 only root server system. Um, so because it's because any changes to the existing root server system are just completely risky and you need to be very very conservative and cautious, one possibility may be to make a separate system. Uh, which, which organizations can use, maintaining the same data, also managed by, by ICANN, um, just that it would be using some, some new topology, some new, like IPv6 only. Um, it might have uh, ECDSA for signatures and some sort of published mechanism for um, uh, verifying signature roles and things like that. As you probably know there's issues right now with the IANA route in terms of rolling the KSK and things like that. So um, so I think if if we hope, so we haven't talked too much about the future and I guess we'll do that later, but it's possible that V6 only can show us a, a way to develop a, a future version of the IANA root server system that can be done in addition to the existing one. So, okay. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, the, the the rolling of the key signing key of the um, of the uh, real the, the production internet root service system, and uh, that has been uh, pushed back for a few months now, because uh, there's some uncertainty what will happen uh, when the key signing key is rolled, because nobody knows nobody hasn't done that before and not in right. the scale of the of the internet. Um, is there any communication between the operators of the uh, original root zone and the UTDNS uh, projects about um, doing doing a, a test run of these, or is that out of scope? Um, well, all right. There's a few issues here. Um, let me start off with the dirty laundry, which is that when we started the project, the engineers who were involved with it just kind of set it up and did it, you know as you would set up any zone um, and they set up to roll the KSKs every month or every three months or something like that um, and the problem with the KSK roll and the root is that you don't have a parent to change your DS records at so for for almost every zone except usually except for the root uh, you don't need a trust anchor because it comes from the root um, so what, what ended up happening is we rolled the key and we did it with the normal a normal roll. Um, the problem is that there's a RFC 5011, which is a way that resolvers can automatically update their trust anchors from the root. Um, however, it has it has a a 30 day hold down timer in there, which is to prevent the root zone from rolling too fast. And I have to admit I'm not convinced of the wisdom of that. But that's the way the draft is written, and um, some resolver operators have su implemented support for that, and others have not. Uh, we noticed that. So what we noticed when we when we rolled the root without 
thinking about it or planning it is that uh, the BIND 9 servers continue to function properly, probably because the BIND 9 developers saw that 30-day recommendation and said that's ridiculous and just threw it out. And the unbound um, resolvers uh, started uh, failing resolution on the on the Yeti root. And the reason for that is because probably the unbound developers read that 30-day requirement and said, okay, it's the spec, we're going to do it. So um, that was kind of an interesting discovery in itself, but it was also kind of a, that was early on in the project. Remember how I said it took a little bit longer than we had hoped? That was one of our early discoveries that maybe we weren't taking this thing as seriously as we need to in terms of organizing and planning stuff. So after that, we stopped rolling our, our own KSK. So we're kind of in the same situation at the root zone of of, um, of of ICANN, the IANA root. So we have been following with great interest the uh, ICANN plans to roll the ICANN KSK, the, uh, the real root KSK. Um, the design team for that has come up with some interesting constraints on that problem. Uh, we talked about packet sizes and fragmentation earlier. Uh, they're very worried about increasing the, the response size at the root zone. Uh, there's been some research which shows that this can cause uh, end users to fail to resolve. Um, on the other hand, we have some, some real world evidence that this doesn't cause problems. For example, I believe the org, org uh, domain uh, would occasionally provide very, very big responses. And, and nobody's complained about not being able to get to uh, Wiki, Wikimedia or Wikipedia. Um, so it's, it's unclear, but in, in the, with an abundance of caution, the idea is to try to make the, the zone as small as possible. Um, so the, the ICANN design team came up with a carefully designed timeline, kind of what, like what you were talking about, to keep the packet sizes small in order to roll the keys in a way that you didn't have um, multiple keys being rolled at once, which should make the packet bigger than necessary. So we've looked at that, and I gave some feedback about this, and there's a process, and, and now they've kind of committed to their rolling, their schedule to roll the, the route. So we had planned for our next experiment after the multi ZSK to be um, a series of Yeti KSK rolls. Uh, our intention is to roll the, roll the basic way first, so there's a recommendation for a KSK role uh, in DNS sec recommended practices, RFCs, and we were going to use that. Um, and then the next step would be to implement a carefully orchestrated role in a way similar to the way that ICANN has proposed. Okay. And then compare the two. Right. So my, my expectation would be that we're not going to have any problems, but our our constraints are quite different from ICANN because we don't have a lot of old legacy software out there. Um, although old in this case we mean five years, but you know it's the internet; things evolve pretty rapidly. Um, and of course, we're IPv6 only, so we we don't know exactly what the uh, what the differences would be. But but we we thought it would be important to see, yeah, indeed see if what the differences are and things like that. Um, in the meantime. Uh, at the last DNS OARC meeting, um, DNS OARC is an organization, uh, it's the DNS uh, Operations and Research Center, and it's a group of people who are very interested in, in DNS. Um, they have a number of facilities, but one of the things they do is twice a year they have technical workshops. And so at the last one, which was a few weeks ago, uh, VeriSign gave a presentation about uh, increasing the size of the ZSK for the root. So right now in the root zone, the KSK, which is managed as we talked about with these HSMs, um, is 2,048 bits. That's RSA algorithm. Um, that's generally considered safe for the next several years, all uh, by cryptographers, I mean, and, and these kind of people. Although there has been some discussion in the last few months about moving to algorithms which are resistant to um, quantum cryptography, but 
<laughs> I think I think that's out of scope for our current concerns. Yeah. Um, but the the ZSK is signed with 1,024 bits, um, which is no longer a recommended key length. It's it's considered it's probably not unsafe. No one's panicking. It's not going to cause major problems. But there is some concern that because of advances in computing power and uh, cryptographers constantly working on new techniques, that 1,024 bits is not going to be safe much longer. Yeah, the security margin is, is, um, is shrinking. Right, right. I, th I think by now the estimation is that um, it, it might even be possible within a month or so that someone could crack such a key with a for a uh, state level actor, someone with, with millions of dollars and, and highly dedicated trade profuse people. So um, so basically it's been recognized that we need to increase the size of the ZSK. This uh, um, this is what VeriSign has announced they're going to do. Uh, the time frame for this is relatively short. Um, it's it's actually quite an interesting contrast between the long uh, multi-stakeholder review technical expert process that we're having for the KSK role, which to be honest is much more dangerous and much more important, and the ZSK size increase, which Verisign kind of just announced, and they're going to do it. So our next experiment that we've actually started is increasing the size of the Yeti ZSK to 2,048 bits. Um, and uh, we we actually kind of skimped on our uh, experiment protocol. We didn't do a lab test for this because we thought that surely this is simple enough that it will work. And it seems like we've been right. Um, we rolled, I believe we just are finishing up our roll because we have three ZSKs to roll. And I think we're just finishing up our third one now. Uh, so that experiment is going on. Once that finishes, um, we will then probably return to looking at the KSK role as an experiment. Now, the relationship between the people working on the real production systems in the Yeti project is um, not bad, but it's also not great. Um, if I think a lot of the people involved with the root server system as well as I can feel quite threatened by Yeti. Um, I don't think they have to feel threatened. Um, I don't really want to criticize anyone's job or, or take over the world or anything like that. We're really just trying to look at interesting questions and, and think of interesting and, and, and uh, improved ways to deliver service in the future. Nevertheless, people are people. Um, and if, maybe if I was on the other side, if I was working for one of those organizations, I would feel differently. So, um, what, so we don't have a close working relationship. Ideally for us, what would happen is someone from one of the current root operators or uh, someone from ICANN or something like that would actually approach us and say, hey, we have an idea for an experiment. Can you please run it for us? We would be happy to do that. We'd say, great. Let's do it. Um, I don't think that's likely to happen. I don't think they want to uh, give the project any more legitimacy than it, than it currently has. Um, and I think a lot of people in, involved may be interested in the results themselves, but not sure if their community would support that. So one of the reasons we're doing everything publicly is so that we can then it'll give us a way to deliver this information to interested engineers and decision makers in these organizations without having to have a direct dialogue. We can say, by the way, we ran the experiment, you may want to take it into consideration and then they can look at it, they can replicate the results on their own, they can discard them for information or these are all possible, but at least the data will be there and they can take these results and uh, hopefully use it to improve the things like the KSK role that are coming up and things like that. Yeah, I think that is the, uh, probably the best possible way in the current situation, um, as political as it is. Yeah. Um, how about the, the software vendors that do DNS software like IC and Elmer Labs? You mentioned that uh, Bind9 
is, is behaving differently than unbound in, in case of a case K rollover. Uh, do they participate? Or do we have project talk to them, like delivering back any results, problems with software that has been detected? Uh, well, I I used to work at ISC, so I know most of the engineers who are still currently working on this on Bind 9. Um, I live in the Netherlands, which is the the white hot heart of DNS in the universe. The hot spot. Exactly. We've got uh, we've got NLNet Labs here, and they make uh, Unbound and NSD. Uh, we've also got PowerDNS, which makes PowerDNS and PowerDNS Recursor. Um, so I've talked to all of these people. Um, for example, uh, the root zone has a few differences from other zones in the way it returns answers. So in the case of priming queries, um, by 9 does not return glue records properly. Well, from our point of view, it's not. It needs to be configured differently to return glue information. Uh, I actually put together a might be a one-line patch, but maybe a three-line patch for by nine, um, which will change the default behavior and so that it will return glue records properly. Now, to be fair, for that to be a an option in by nine would probably take a few hundred lines of code because you'd want to have an option configured, you need to document it, you need to test it, uh, you need to have, be, have people be able to turn it on or off. And it's kind of a corner case. So I can see why they might not want to make it a, uh, an option. And, and changing the default behavior is always risky. So, um, But we've had a discussion with, with fine nine engineers about that. Um, we have also had, um, we've had people from CZNIC testing their new resolver. Uh, CZNIC is the check registry, and they make they've made their own DNS server, the not DNS server. They're currently, I believe, in a beta phase for the not DNS resolver. Uh, earlier on, when they were doing that, they actually used our Yeti system for doing testing of some kind. I don't know. We saw a lot of traffic for them, so I don't know the details there. But we were able to discover a bug in the not resolver. Uh, not really a bug, but a, a strange way it, it handled name compression. Um, so it would do name compression on a zero byte label or something like that, because the root is zero bytes. Nice. And technically, you can compress that, um, although the compression is longer than the actual uh, uncompressed version. Um, so that wasn't really a bug. It met the spec, although it was uh, questionable that, if that is useful. Questionable. Um, but it did also it tickled another bug in uh, the Go language uh, DNS library that Meet Gibson maintains, which is really nice. Um, but it also triggered a bug in that, so that was quite interesting. Um, we've also I've I've also talked to the people from Power DNS. I mentioned they're another Dutch DNS vendor. Uh, they said that the Power DNS software would not properly serve the root zone. But they took an effort to fix it, so it does that. So they actually said that they can actually serve the Yeti server, uh, the Yeti zone, and participate in the project. So I've I've gotten interest from from PowerDNS, and I'm hoping to convince their engineers to run a Yeti root server um, because no one else is currently running a Yeti server uh, using PowerDNS. Probably because it wouldn't have worked before, and you need to run it out of their their latest Git branch. Um, and I talked to some of the people at NLNet Labs. They're interested, but they don't have a lot of time. But we also do already have people running NSD uh, and people running uh, Unbound resolvers. Um, likewise, with CZ Nick, I think they're interested. We already have someone running not resolvers or not not servers though, so it's not completely necessary that they be the ones to do it. Um, and we have, of course people running by, we run by ourselves. I think all three of the um, coordinators run by for our servers. Um, ISC is in a special place though because they are not only a DNS vendor of open source software, but they also run the effort name yes, server. Yes. Um, so I, 
I've had conversations with many of the root operators to try to convince them to join the project. Um, some of them are interested, but they're concerned about the optics, about how it looks. Um, some of them are interested, but they say they need work to convince their communities. Uh, some of them, like ISC, are not interested at all. Um, and I think uh, that, of course, that's every root operator has their own their own uh, priorities and political position and things like that. So it's not unexpected, um, but it would have been nice if, um, if 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 these cannot run for certain reasons uh, um, or participate uh, with the ED root server. Maybe someone from our audience can do. Um, yeah. What is is the the project already full, or is there still a space to participate? Right. So, one of the questions that we want to answer when we started the project was, what are the breaking points of the root server system? Um, so, the experiments that we've talked about so far are mostly ones that we expect to work. We expect servers to continue delivery maybe with some slight degradation in quality as the packets become bigger and bigger, but basically we expect things to continue to work. Um, we know that there are going to be some limits. At some point, the system will fail. So, for example, if there were uh, a thousand root servers, performance would not be optimal. <laughs> yes. right? um, but what about 500? Probably not good, but 250? I don't know. At some point, it's going to be bad. And so one of the questions that we hope to answer is, how many servers is too many, right? Uh, we have other similar questions like, how fast can you add and remove root name servers? Uh, right now, the process takes uh, months to do, with typically maybe even a year or two of preparation. In the, uh, in the original root, not in, in the In the IANA root, yes, yeah, sorry, in the IANA root. And I don't say, when I say add and remove name servers, I actually mean change the IP address of name servers because we haven't had any changes for 17 years or whatever. But um, so these are the kind of questions we want to ask. But when we started the project, uh, the coordinators declared that we wanted to have 25 root server instances. This was not done based on any scientific or mathematical analysis of packet sizes or anything. It was just sort of, if we have 25 root server operators, then we know there's a lot of interest. Um, and that's double, more than double the amount of root server operators in the, the ICANN, the, the IANA root. So one of the, one of the questions that uh, political people always ask is, you know, why can't my country have a root name server? And Historically, the answer has often been, oh, we'd love to, but there's simply no room left. Um, so one of the things that Yeti Project has already shown, which is true for DNS people, we've known this for many years, is that's just a lie. There's been, you could have added, added root name servers for many years now. Um, so getting back to the question of how many, how many can we have, how many root server operators are possible, today we actually do have 25 uh, instances, 25 entries in the root, in the root zone. It, it's, it's a little bit of a fiction though because many of those are run by the same operators. There's a, the first, the first group to do that was a French group of, of researchers and other people interested in France. They had already run one Yeti root name server and they wanted to run another one using different software in a different environment and we thought, okay, that's fine. Um, then we realized a few months ago that we were having, we were not adding new root server operators very quickly. Um, this is because, to be honest, we have been more focused on getting our backend infrastructure sorted out properly and looking at the actual experiments. So we kind of stopped this kind of trying to convince people to join the project activity. Um, but we still wanted to get more servers. So we decided, look, the, the French researchers have, have added uh, extra servers and it seems okay, we'll just add more servers ourselves. So we put out a call to the discussion list of people working on Yeti. He said, look, if you want to run more name servers, that's great, let's let's do it. And we were able to get one other organization to do that. Uh, there's a 
Indian uh, research organization, which now runs, I think, four, maybe five, something like that, uh, of the Yeti root servers. And then the BII group, my company, uh, we run, I think, six or something like that of the root name servers. Um, so we have a couple problems in trying to decide when to add more name servers. What we'd like to do right now is add additional name servers from additional operators and then remove the ones that we're running, right? We don't want to continue to run them. We prefer to have different organizations running the name servers. Um, the, the main issue there is that we have a lot of name servers in Europe, which is not a problem necessarily. I think it has to do with the fact that there's a lot of DNS in Europe. Um, because of the CCTLD model, where every country has its own top-level domain, Europe has small countries, and there's a lot of them. So there's a lot of people doing DNS at that level. Um, plus, you know, it's a rich part of the world. You have a lot of network activity and things like that. A lot of people interested in this stuff. So um, I think more than half of our name servers are, our name server organizations are in Europe. Um, so what? What, we, what we'd like to do, what we really want, what would be super exciting for us, is more people in other parts of the world. We don't have any African participants, for example. Uh, we don't have anyone in Oceania. We've only got very few people in Asia and only one participant in South America, things like that. Um, so uh, while anyone who wants to join the project, at this point, we're not turning anyone away. We'll be happy to add more, add more name servers. But if we had our choice, We'd love to have someone in Africa or um, uh, Australia or New Zealand or something like that because those are parts of the world that um, are currently far away from the heart of the internet and, and don't have some, as many name servers now. Um, but even if we got, say, 10 more participants and got rid of all of our sort of double name servers, we have no specific reason to, to not add more. Um, what, what, what we would do, I think, is if we got to the point where we had, say, 30 participants, we would probably start looking at the data and try to figure out, with, with the other experimenters, other researchers, what kind of heuristics we want to have for this, right? So um, at what point do we decide, hey, we're going to turn down an old server and add a new one or things like that? You know, we you can imagine a whole bunch of different criteria for that, but we haven't had that problem yet. We may not. Um, another thing which we didn't mention is that this project is expected to be a limited duration. It's not the the project has a built-in uh, end point. Uh, it's a three-year project. We're now one year in. Uh, we just started the experimental phase. Uh, the expectation is that we'll continue this for a while. I mean, we know we don't have a date that we've all agreed to and we'll shut the project down, but we will probably end it eventually. It's a research project. It's not a, it's not a production network or anything like that. So, I um, understand from following the, the mailing list that also an important part is to have people running DNS resolvers that use the UDDNS project. Um, I can imagine there are people, people uh, from the technical community interested in doing that and maybe um, reconfiguring their, um, their private resolvers to, to point to the DDNS project. But it might also be interesting not to run the, like the latest software, but um, in order to find bugs in like how does maybe older software, maybe not so often used software um, react on a, on a KSK rollover in the root zone uh, to run not the latest greatest, but maybe have a good mix in there? That's, that's an interesting question. Um, well, another thing that we haven't talked about is proprietary software. Um, all the software that we've been talking about so far has been uh, open source stuff because, frankly, we're network guys. You know, we, we're quite comfortable with, you know, Unix servers and things like that. Um, so we don't have Microsoft in there. There's no uh, Cisco CMS, or I don't know what the CNR. CNR. There's no Cisco CNR, which is probably the biggest DNS resolver in the world. Or so. Um, yeah, we don't. We don't know. I don't know. I don't know if that's super important, but that's 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 a missing piece. 
um, older versions of software. That's quite interesting. Um, it might be nice if someone someone wanted to configure their, you know, Red Hat RHEL version four or five or whatever the oldest one is, and see what happens with that resolver. Um, it's a bit tricky because, of course, security bugs happen. So you need to make sure it's old but maintained and patched, yeah, yeah. right? But please some, don't run. Some, please some. don't run bind date for this. No. <laughs> but old like Red Hat Enterprise Linux five and six are still maintained, uh, right. and um, but they have quite old versions of bind in there. Nine six, yeah. I guess. Yeah, that, that would be quite interesting to see what happens with that. I mean, it's it's always a problem in the uh, in the software world, especially in the networking world, about um, the trade-off between enterprise versus uh, latest and greatest stuff. Uh, administrators usually want stuff to never have to change. Like, it works. Please don't make me upgrade because it's going to break a bunch of stuff and I'm going to have to lose my holidays. Um, whereas uh, sometimes you say, well, this old one didn't work quite the right way. It's not. It's a bug, maybe, but it's also just not a very good feature. And so you want you want to encourage people to upgrade to the the way that does everything better, but they don't want to do it. So there's about there's a bunch of tension there, and we haven't really addressed that. So maybe that's something we can talk about uh, within our discussion community. We'd love to have that. We have a really hard time convincing people to run resolvers. It's been a long-standing issue in the project, um, which is there's there's a kind of built-in tension there because. So the idea here is that you take your normal DNS resolver, bind or unbound or not DNS resolver, and instead of having it go to the default uh, root servers, the, the IANA hints, um, you use the Yeti servers instead. It's actually quite a simple change. We have it documented for two types of resolvers, maybe three now. Um, so it's easy to do. Um, but because the Yeti network is experimental, um, it's quite possible that it's going to break at some point. And if we expect any breakage, we will definitely let people know and discuss it on the list in advance. Nevertheless, the reason we're doing these experiments is because we don't know what's going to happen. Um, so we cannot recommend that someone take their, say, their corporate uh, internal resolver and pointed at the Yeti system because their boss may get very angry if all of a sudden things break because they got packets that are too big or because it's using some uh, signature format that's not recognized or something like that. Um, so so we have this tension, right? And we've, we've tried to come up with clever ways to, to work around that. W one approach is um, one that my colleagues have done with the uh, BUPT, the Beijing University of Post and Telecom, and what they've done there is they have uh, some buildings that students go to classes in and, and meet with their professors, and they have Wi-Fi networks set up, and they've, they've added a Wi-Fi network that uses the Eddy project um, uh, for its re DNS resolution, and I think that's quite an interesting, clever solution because it's Wi-Fi, and if all of a sudden your Wi-Fi network breaks, you go to another one. People have been trained. So, um, not sure what happened to my video, uh, but it was at the at the end uh, of the presentation anyway. So I'm switching back now to my slides. Um, I hope you enjoyed the interview with Shane. And. Uh, at the end, he was talking about uh, how uh, interested people can um, um, join the project by running uh, their resolvers against the Yeti DNS root name servers. And uh, he, we have uh, prepared a small tutorial uh, how you can configure your bind or unbound to work with um, uh, Yeti DNS. Be careful here. It's uh, it's an experimental project, so there might be glitches and downtime. Although um, I haven't seen any big problems in the last year where I was running uh, a resolver and uh, also one of the uh, ETDNS root name servers. So having, having a, a 
critical mission, critical network running on EATDNS might not be good, but a research or internal IT stuff network, uh, wireless might be okay. And EATDNS is IPv6 only, so in order to participate, you would need to have uh, uh, an IPv6 connectivity and an IPv6 address. Uh, native IPv6, of course, works best, but if you only have a tunnel, that's okay as well, it works. So, I did all the um, uh, tutorials here on the latest Ubuntu. Uh, it works on other Linuxes and Unix flavors quite similar. So, here on Ubuntu, first step, of course, is to install Bind9, and then uh, the uh, wget command downloads the root hints. Uh, of course, you cannot use the built-in root hints from Bind, because they are for the IANA root name servers um, on GitHub there is the file for the uh, Yeti DNS root hints. You download them, uh, we put them here into Etsy bind Yeti root dot hints, and then we configure the uh, uh, bind uh, configuration file, the namedy.conf.local that is on Ubuntu, with um, a root hint zone uh, pointing to the downloaded file, and the um, DNSSEC key signing key for the uh, Yeti project which is there for DNSSEC validation. Once we have done that, um, we have to disable the uh, IANA root hints, uh, which on Ubuntu are still in a file format, so the bind uh, on Ubuntu doesn't rely on the built-in root hints, so we have to uh, remove these. Best is to just comment it out, don't delete that entry, so that you can switch back if you like. A name you check conf uh, will check whether the configuration file is still uh, sane and can be loaded, and then system control for system D restart and status should uh, reconfigure and restart the bind line. And then for testing, we send with dig a query to the local address on that server asking for the name servers for the dot for the root zone, and back we will see all the 25 um, uh, root name server names and importantly, check the AD flag, uh, telling us whether DNSSEC validation is enabled. And for Unbound, it's it's similar, but uh, also as Shane mentioned, Unbound is a little bit more picky, and uh, I found that configuring the Yeti DNS for Unbound can be more difficult than Bind, uh, so if you uh, want to have the easy way, uh, you can use Bind. So here we install Unbound, and then we use wget uh, to download the root hints again and configure the uh, configuration file on unbound uh, sorry on ubuntu the unbound configuration file can be split into multiple files which are living in unbound.conf.d and here we have a file yeti-root.conf which only concern uh, contains the root hints configuration Then we download the uh, key signing key for the Yeti project and put that into varlib unbound root dot key. And now it's important to disable uh, the use of unbound anchor. Unbound anchor is a tool that is bundled with unbound that will fetch the root key signing key from a TLS secured website, which is like um, an extra uh, a safety net in case that RC5011 rollovers will not work. But of course that website, it's the IANA website only contains the IANA root key and not the JT root key. So we have to disable that kind of extra functionality and that is being done in Etsy default unbound with root trust anchor update equals false, as, as we see here. You put that into that file and that uh, tells the start script not to run unbound anchor. Now we check the configuration, unbound check conf, um, and restart unbound, check the status, and uh, if there's no error message, all should be good. And we do the same um, uh, test whether uh, the uh, DNS resolver is now active. We'll ask for the NS records for the root zone for dot, and then we see the 25 uh, YT root name servers, and it should have the AD flag to tell us that uh, DNSSEC validation is uh, successfully configured. 
So all of uh, that is not very complicated, should be easy to do for any DNS administrator, but uh, take care that you have um, a configuration pointing to the IANA routes handy. So in case there is some breakage and you need to do some work done, that you can switch over to the uh, to the uh, production IANA routes uh, in case you need to uh, prepare for, for that in advance. So here we have some resources if you want to get more information. There's the website, yetidinas.org. There's a mailing list with a lot of good information. You can there, there follow what kind of experiments are running and what are the, the glitches on the experiments and the results. There's a statistics page that, uh, very similar to the IANA root name service, runs um, uh, a monitoring service where you can look at what kind of requests are going to the YetiDNS servers. Um, uh, you know, what kind of uh, record types have been requested and so on. And there is a, a monitoring of the root name server systems themselves, so the 25 root name servers are monitored by RAPE Atlas probes and you can see the results there on the monitoring page. Before we come to the question section, I would like to uh, point your attention to our upcoming training classes. We will have a special IPv6 introduction and advanced workshop uh, beginning of August in Livermore in California. And this will be a one of a kind. Uh, it is a special workshop being designed for one of our customers and uh, but the customer uh, decided to also make it open to the public. So uh, if you're interested to join that workshop, uh, uh, you find here the link where you can sign up for this. Uh, then we have the Kia DHCP workshops, um, which is one in August in Amsterdam and two more in the US in October, West Coast and East Coast. And then in November, another one in, in Amsterdam, Kia DHCP being the new DHCP server from, from IEC. And here we have more trainings. Um, I won't go through all of them. You can go to our training website and see them, but there's uh, a lot of DNS uh, and uh, DNSSEC workshops coming on, both in Europe and in the US. And uh, IEC also does webinars, and uh, I would like to point you to, to uh, one webinar that goes more deeper into the, the Kia DHCP and we have uh, covered uh, that new product in our own webinars. There will be one how you can extend, uh, extend the, the Kia DHCP server with hooks, uh, which are there to implement extra functionality, which is uh, maybe required and not currently available. So that concludes this uh, webinar on the ETDNS. Let's see, do we have any questions? Uh, Karsten, if I might step in here, um, unfortunately, I don't see any questions in the um, in the go to webinar uh, questions functionality. Might also be that all questions have been answered during the interview. Yes, it's well. Um, since I don't see any, anybody typing in, um, I would like to um, thank you all for attending and and thank you, Karsten, for this very informative webinar. Uh, I want to in, encourage everyone to visit our website to get familiarized with upcoming webinars as well as get uh, recording and slides from our previous webinars. And I believe, um, is there anything on your end, Karsten, that you would like to uh, finish up with? or? Yes, um, this was the first webinar where we had this new format of having an interview. Mm -hmm. And I would very much like to have uh, feedback, if that is possible, uh, if, uh, if, if uh, there's interest to have more of these, uh, like uh, getting personalities from the DNS uh, community and, and have them in, in a pint cut part of an interview. Um, or if um, our audience would like to prefer to have the, um, the webinars like they have been in the past. Okay, I'll make sure to um, include this since I will be sending out um, the recording to those that uh, attended as well as um, those that signed up but weren't able to join. So I'll make sure that I'll, I'll uh, put in this question of 
how they would like to see our our future webinars and hopefully we'll get uh, good feedback on that uh, anything else on your end no i'm fine okay so that was excellent so i think uh, as i said before just visit our website to see uh, previous recording and slides and uh, until next time thank you karsten and for all the attendees enjoy the day thank you Laura. have a good day yeah you bye too bye-bye